Recall what was said in our last video. That video noted that the hippocampus plays a large role in setting up episodic memory that we can consciously recall. Those memories then fade out or get transferred to other nearby parts of the brain and also to become less and less episodic. As noted at the end of our last video, the same is not true of procedural memory, the vast collection of skills we can summon consciously. They work very differently, and they get fixed in memory differently. It is as though the consciousness system had an inbox for recalling memories to mind and an outbox for consciously ordering up procedures. Both boxes have ties to the main information management and records system, the brain's memory, but the two boxes are different and work through different channels. Among the reasons we know this is the fact that amnesiacs, people who cannot form new consciously recallable declarative memories, can learn new skills. So if you give an amnesiac ping-pong lessons, his or her playing skills will tend to improve. They may improve slowly, but they will improve significantly despite the fact that the trainee cannot recall any of the training sessions. Well then, if the hippocampus is the inbox, where's the outbox? We don't know for sure, but it looks as though something akin to the outbox is a large assembly of gray matter coordinators that include the blue areas shown. Like the hippocampus, these skill-related coordinators are well connected. And besides their connections to other influential brain structures, they are intimately connected to the thalamus. That's especially important because the thalamus is the brain's big relay station for incoming sensory impulses, and so it is the first place where nearly all sensory data about procedural actions underway get received. Also, the thalamus receives lots of feedback from sensory and other parts of the brain, and appears to be a major player in conscious awareness. Therefore, the thalamus looks like a good place for issuing split-second instructions to modify procedural activities. Instructions like, you'd better shift your tennis racket to the right because the incoming ball's off course. Given the slow speed of brain impulses, one would naturally expect such a command center to be as close as possible to the prime coordinator of consciously activated procedural memories. And assuming the roles we have outlined for the skill-related coordinators and the thalamus are correct, that is precisely what we find. Now if these procedural coordinators are responsible for establishing connections to procedures we can consciously recall, and if these procedures can be changed by experience as in learning to play tennis, drive a car, master a language, or do any of a million other things, then we can see these procedural coordinators playing a role in procedural memory that somewhat resembles the role played by the hippocampus in declarative memory. But however similar in these respects, the two memory systems have a striking difference. The hippocampus is very sensitive and stands ready to create episodic memories of this morning's breakfast or this afternoon's robin at a moment's notice. But the skill coordinators, so far as we can tell, don't work like that. You can't learn to serve a tennis ball or play a fiddle in a moment, and if you do by chance get something right, you generally can't repeat it. Instead, getting things right consistently takes days, weeks, or months of practice, and if you want to keep your skills well honed, you need to keep practicing, which is why professional musicians and athletes alike spend hours practicing daily when they don't happen to be giving a performance or playing a game. This seems reasonable. We need our episodic memories, our memories of events. We'd have a hard time managing our lives if we couldn't recall what we've done earlier in the day, where we've been, who we've seen, and what activities don't need repeating. That's a prime reason why millions of people with Alzheimer's disease, which has a penchant for attacking the hippocampus, have a tough time and tend to lead lives that are quite limited. But clearly, 
the brain's vast and carefully developed data stores should not be sacrificed willy-nilly on the altar of episodic memory. That does not have survival value. So how has evolution developed episodic memory without devastating these data banks? One way it has done so is by making the hippocampus very sensitive. In fact, the hippocampus is really just a gopher, as in gopher coffee. The gopher doesn't take and store most memories. It just sets up short-lived connections to them, ready for use as needed. By comparison, other parts of the brain's data handling system, including its procedural memory system, act much more like conservative bankers. They continually receive inputs and produce outputs, deposits and payments in banking terms, and that means making continual minor changes but they don't make major changes in response to weak stimuli. Otherwise, they would be changing their holdings all the time and instead of being well organized would be a shambles. So they require repeated stimuli or strong stimuli or very specific sorts of stimuli in order to change significantly. It is this key difference between the fast-acting gopher's methods on the one hand and the conservative banker's procedures on the other that appears to explain how we can have our episodic memories without upsetting the brain's main data stores. This leads to another point about learned procedural memories. It might seem nice to set up procedural memories the way we set up episodic memories. It might seem nice to learn how to play perfect tennis in a day. But there are problems. For one thing, episodic memories are neither perfect nor complete. The gopher just makes connections to existing data. He doesn't deepen or refine those data. So you can recall what you had for breakfast and maybe some articles you read in the morning paper, but you can't recall the exact headlines, much less the exact text of those articles. Also, episodic memories fade out. Most last a day or two at best. So it might seem sweet to become a world-class tennis player in a matter of hours, assuming you could deepen and refine the necessary memories in that length of time, but not if you then proceeded in a few days to forget nearly everything that you had learned. For these reasons, and maybe others, we learn new procedures by the banker's rules, not the gophers. To gain a new skill, we go through the motions repeatedly, slowly forming, stimulating, strengthening, and modifying complex brain connections. And once we have that skill in place, we must still practice it repeatedly to ensure that our hard-earned neural connections don't weaken or vanish from disuse, and also to restore those connections which get overwritten or run into other problems. Beyond that, it seems clear that this whole business is a challenge for both the gopher and the bankers. The memories we can consciously recall are incomplete and sometimes unreliable. The skills we can summon up are hard to establish. And beyond these two classes of memory tied to consciousness, the brain's vast data store, the brain's memory, is continually balanced on a knife edge between being too hard to establish on the one hand and too easy to change on the other. What's more, all these kinds of memory are being shaped by exposure to external events over which the brain has only limited control. And this shaping happens while we're awake, at a time when levels and types of brain activity are dictated not by memory processing and consolidation needs, but by our own needs for living, sustenance, and survival. All of this raises a simple question. Isn't there a better way? Besides processing and refining memory by day, shouldn't it be done at night? Indeed it should, and in fact it is. As noted earlier, in recent years we have come to realize that our nights host intense repeated cycles of memory processing vital to our welfare. That is a subject deserving special attention and one that relates to dreams. So one of the last videos on this brain channel 
in the section How Dreams Work deals specifically with this fascinating subject of nighttime memory processing and dreams.